Okay, welcome back or welcome to the Yogi Ross Show. You know how we do it around here. We are diving into sports and humanity. And this is the final part of a really cool series that I've curated over the course of really the spring and summer, which is titled, What Does It Mean to Make It? In air quotes. And I've talked to quarterbacks about that exact phrase. And I love that phrase for many reasons, because here we are in a world of recruiting. We put people on pedestals because that's what we do. I'm a part of that at the Elite 11. And most of the time they don't make it in the eyes of those who follow recruiting. But some of them have degrees, multiple. Some of them have kids and are amazing parents. Some have finally had a, a life that they've desired. And some have the journey of today's guest. And today's guest is a very special one. Is the reason I saved it for the final of this series. His name is Pat Hoderny. Pat was my quarterback at Pitt. We came in together. We lived together. We've competed together. We've gone through many moments in life together. So with that, Pat, welcome to the show, man. Yogi, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I've seen the blurbs of the guests that preceded me, and uh, I'm in pretty cool company. I'm feeling kind of honored right now. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, well, let's, let's kick it off way back in the day. Um, you were a big recruit. You know, Recruiting wasn't a huge deal like it is today, but I read somewhere earlier that you were the 18th best quarterback in the country. You're, you're in the conversation, top 20, 30 guys. You go to Pitt and decide to sign coming out of high school in Erie. What, what was the, the vision you had for yourself at 15, 16, 17, 18 years old when you were playing high school football and being loved by people all over the country? Uh, it felt like I was doing what I was good at. Uh, I don't know how much of a vision you have for yourself or that I had for myself at that age, but uh, you come up playing baseball, playing soccer, playing basketball when you're the tall kid, you know, and um, that's, that's sort of your identity in a way you're, 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 you're ripping it and you, folks might not know you in the, in the hallway at school, but they, you know, oh yeah, that's the QB. Okay. The QB. Okay. The, he's the basketball guy. Um, so it just kind of felt like I was doing what, I, I was supposed to be doing because I was good at it and uh, it was fun for me mostly um, I you know I didn't I didn't experience the success as a starter in high school that uh, a couple of the teams did before me but still being a part of the program it was a big pro it was a 4A school in Pennsylvania which at the time was like that that was the top tier competition and um, we played a nice healthy schedule we went to Pittsburgh we went to Eastern PA played Alatoon State College. Uh, you might know those guys who played Upper St. Clair. Um, so it, it was a, it was a good experience all around. I, I don't, I, to your point, to your question, what my vision was, I, I'm not sure, Yogi. I, like I'll say it again. I think I was doing what I was supposed to be doing is the way I felt. Uh, it, it just, it always felt like the next Friday, the next season, the next, the next year. And when I went to Pitt, that was the next, that was what they said was the next thing. So uh, there we were at the Towers <laughs> sometime yeah. around June. Totally. Yeah, it was probably like right around now. We both went to college a little early to work out. I'll never forget it. It's still to this day, Pat, the best night of sleep I've ever had from our first oh. workout because we just got absolutely destroyed doing plank. Like I do planks now and I'm like, this is nothing compared to Buddy Morris and the Pitt Panthers and what we had to do that summer in that gymnasium. Yeah, what an eye-opening ex experience that was to get there and remember they didn't have the air conditioning on because it was summertime so we had the yeah. windows open and we're up on like the umpteenth floor i don't know if the elevators worked all the time like it was hot we were, uh, yeah it was it was that was an experience that first night of sleep i'll, I'll never forget it. it was definitely real light out when we passed out that night <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was like, I remember a six on the clock for sure. And then I remember another six because that's when we woke up the following morning. Uh, but, but I also remember some, some things about you and, and you know the deal with me on this. I, I only ask questions I don't know the answers to. And today we're going to go hard on your story. You've been willing to get vulnerable about your path. So we're going we're gonna to get to all that and go there. But as a teammate, I think this is unique. Like most people I've interviewed in this, I either saw in recruiting or I watched them play as a fellow player around the same age, you, you, we were on the same team. You know, we, we threw to each other. I, I can't tell you how many times I've caught a pass from you in my career. You, you throw, threw me my first pass ever, and I think it was your first completion ever against Syracuse at Heinz Field back in 2001, I think it was. Uh, but with that said, when you came in, I saw a huge recruit, a big dude. I was like, yeah, that's what they're supposed to look like. 
That's what quarterbacks are supposed to look like. And like any freshman, I think it both it hit both of us of like, whoa, this isn't going to be easy. This is a challenge. How do you think that you dealt with that reality as as a young player? Because I think there were huge expectations on you when you came to college. I think it was Pat Hoderny, 6'6", one of the top quarterbacks in the country. He's going to go play for Walt Harris, who is known for developing that position. And look out, here comes the future of pit football. That, that, that's what I felt the vision was for you. Sure. I, I, um, being honest, I don't think I dealt with it, you know, really well. I, uh, I know I was really intimidated. There was a lot of talent in that QB room. My freshman year, we had John Turman, Dave Priestley, Rod Rutherford. Um, and, uh, the feeling really out of place, like these guys, John and Dave both had won games at a college level. Rod was a huge recruit. One of the biggest recruits I think Pitt had ever landed, uh, up, up to that point in time out of Perry high school. And he was a year ahead of me and uh, very different player than me, but super talented. So I just felt sort of out of place. Like, all right, what do I, what do I do here? How do I get my feet on the ground? How do I start going? And the thing is nobody really, sometimes you land in a program where nobody really tells you that you're, you're left to figure it out a lot on your own. And I don't think that I had the, um, I wasn't primed. Nobody said, hey, when you get down there, you're going to have a lot of figuring out to do. And, and I didn't necessarily, ha I didn't have the tools in the toolbox to, to get traction early. So most of what I learned early was on accident. Uh, I had to make mistakes to, to figure out the rules. And that was sort of my, my MO early on. You were, you were close to that. Um, so that was, the, that was the general feeling, a little sense of loss, a, little, a big sense of intimidation. Um, you know, you felt like you were in the big pond right away division one football when the when the big east was miami and virginia tech mike vick um you know untold number of number uh, first round draft picks at miami and and that was your schedule so it, it was national tv it was notre dame and here you are kid from your epa what are you what are you going to do now what are you going to do next yeah, that, that's funny that you say that because i never once would have said pat feels intimidated like i i felt like you walked into the building like you belonged. And if anything had the, you know, we always talk about quarterbacks, right? Pat, Pat does the elite 11 along with me and now Rod Rutherford, he's been coaching. He coached in Florida at the regional, which is so amazing that full yeah. circle is there. Uh, but I, I felt like you walked in like literally and figuratively with like your chest up just cause you've got a big torso. Right. But also right. because it, it felt like your presence was, like was on purpose gonna be gonna be sensed. Like I never felt that like Pat didn't have it figured out. I was a walk on. Like I was just fighting my ass off, as you know. But you, I was like, oh dude, he's he can flick his wrist and the ball goes fifty yards, right? He's smart. He's got a great family. Like shit, Pat's got it. He's got it nailed. Like now it's just a matter of when Priestley and uh, Johnny Terman graduate, let the competition kind of begin. But I never knew that you felt felt that way. And I think it's key because I think most quarterbacks probably would feel that same way when they walk into a program. Yeah, I probably, if you saw that, it was a false sense of security. Um, maybe, maybe faking it, maybe some naivete. Um, I had some things naturally that, you know, lent to me. Accuracy, arm strength, and those things. You had some things naturally that lent to you, you could you could map out your month. You knew what it was going to take to get an A in a class. You knew what you wanted to get better at every single week. And so I think that, you know, your flick of the wrist was plotting out like your plan, your goals, your uh, what was going to be your roadmap to success and getting on the field and contributing to that program at the level that you did. And um, my flick of the wrist, all it all it did was you know get the ball and. Donnie Patrick's hand streaking down the field or Antonio's or Larry's, you know, but on the practice, on the practice field, it didn't, uh, it didn't get me to the games because I didn't have that wherewithal off the field to earn the trust of the coaching staff well enough to get on the field. So I know that now, but um, I'd say, you know, some humility would have lent to me and in a little bit of a sense of like, Hey, you got to map this out. You got to play in this. You got to, you got to wake up and, and make your bed. And that's how your day's got to start every day. Knowing, knowing what you want to get better at today, uh, both in class. Yeah. And field. So I want to ask you this, um, cause I, I kind of believe it, but I'm curious if you do, 
I think a, a lot of times we paint a picture of a quarterback in a lens that often suggests they have it figured out. That individual has a plan. That individual understands how to lead. That individual is going to be football smart. And on and on and on and on and on. That individual is good looking. That indiv- et cetera. That individual is the alpha. That individual commands respect. That individual is the captain. Whereas now at almost 40 and being in this game in college since for 22 years, I feel, or 20 plus, yeah, 22 years, I feel as though all that's BS. And I feel like everything has to be taught. And I feel as though coaches now know that way differently than they knew it then. Because you got coached hard. I watched Walt Harris, who I will send this to and will listen to, he coached you hard, coached everybody in that room hard, but you really hard. So it's not like you weren't getting instruction, but I felt like to the point of what you just referenced, like, and again, tell me if you disagree, the blind spots or the areas where you didn't have knowledge or expertise, or you called it naivete, could have been helped. What, what do you think about that? A uh, phrase comes to mind, learn your learner, you know, and I think that's what you and I didn't get as much exposure to in 2000, 2001, 2002, um, that kids do today. And I would say to your point that uh, the the expectation is that the QB, the the guy that's supposed to be the starter, who's got the five stars, that he's supposed to have a plan and be able to do all that stuff. But your natural talents can carry you so far, right up probably until that moment when you enter a division one program because there's so much more to it to be successful once you get there and if you don't if you don't at least understand that and somebody there can't find a way to communicate that to you then it's going to be tough and I think that's one of the things that I love the most about Elite 11 and the things that I've been exposed to through what you guys do um, as a volunteer in that orbit is is that like it's so much about being a person it's what is it going to take to be the type of person who can succeed as a college player, understanding the media obligations and the exposure you're going to get and what your image um, says for you and, you know, how it can help you and how it can hurt you and what it means to be a family man. And if you have a girlfriend at the time, a good boyfriend, a good boyfriend, you know, all those things, a good, a good partner to what your situation is like understanding relationships. Those are all the things that we didn't get uh, very much exposure to. You might've had a different, you know, your room might've been different, but um, Coach Harris is juggling a lot of balls and head coach, QB coach. He did coach me really hard. And uh, I, I think that he was great at coaching the position. He was great at teaching the West Coast offense. Um, you know, we didn't have a lot of time for empathy in that room and we didn't have a lot of time to, uh, quote unquote, learn the learner. I think he expected me to learn the same way that John did, the same way that Rod did, the same way that Tyler eventually did, Luke, you know, um, and that was going to work for who, who, whose style it fit. And it was not going to work for whose style it didn't. And, uh, and, and I think that that held true in my story at the University of Pittsburgh. Yeah. Yeah. I'd agree. I think it's so hard now. I think great word, empathy. I have so much I've had so much more empathy for coaches, head coaches who coach a position and call plays since my experience at Pitt, right? And, you know, after coaching, of course, you recognize the demands that are on the position and then the recruiting aspect of it. So, yeah, I think that everybody did their best at the time. And yeah, I, I guess I'll kind of end with that because, because I still think that you had an amazing amount of potential. So, so the next question I want to ask you is like, if you look back on that, because we're going to get to, we're, we're going to move it forward here in a second. But when you look back on that, did you feel like you needed someone to grab you by the arms and say, Pat, this is what's happening, man. Like uh, you've got this amazing arm. You've got this amazing ability. I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Or do you feel like you grew a distaste in the game? Cause you end up transferring after your second season and leaving a golden opportunity, not even giving yourself a chance to compete with Rod, you know, for this job. Yeah. 
uh, I did need somebody to grab me uh, and and say, hey, this is what this is really about. Um, you might think you can make the throws, the best throws that those guys on the field are making, but here's everything that goes into making that throw. And that's really what I never grasped. I wasn't, it's not that I wasn't interested in grasping. It's just that it wasn't, uh, it wasn't put in terms that I could understand at that time. No fault of anybody's. I was, a, I was, I was as young and dumb as they come, but, um, I needed to be, I needed to be grabbed and, re and related to a little bit, I think, and related with, and, um, that's just something that I, I don't think coach Harris didn't try to do that. But again, I think that in that, that we just, we just spoke different languages. Yeah. I think when it came to it, he, he told me about my potential, but I didn't understand how that could manifest. And no, you, I didn't envision myself as it was hard for me to see myself as a starter because I was getting beat up in a room so badly every single day. Yeah. And, you know, when, you, <laughs> when that's the situation and somebody over across the room who is a starter isn't, then you're like, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to, I don't know how to take this block in my grade sheet and turn it into John's like eight words <laughs> or Dave's eight words or Rod's eight words. Like there was just so much to eliminate. I didn't know where to start. And so it was, it was just too heavy for me. I don't think yeah. full, full admittance. It was too heavy for me. Okay. Uh, I want to follow up on that in a second. I want to talk about a light moment. I look at your college stats at Pitt. You go three of eight in your career. But your yeah. completion, what was the route? What was the throw? What, what was that like for you? And I'm going to tell my experience. First first completion? Yeah. Yeah, versus Syracuse at home. We were up We were, uh, in a game that, you know, it was a big game for the program. I don't know if anybody remembers the name Dwight Freeney, but he was he was tearing things up. And we were able to take him out of the equation and we, we grew enough of a lead late in that game that I got to, I got to go in. And um, my first, first play was the same play. It was uh 84 pop route to the short, to, to his short field. And I fumbled the snap. It was shotgun. I, I it got <laughs> Polarski just darted it at my feet. So I fell on it and got pummeled a little bit. And then coach gave me the old, like this one, yeah, run so it again. Huddle up, <laughs> run it again. And I am pretty sure I was supposed to work the wide side of the field, but there's just no way I wasn't going to the short side to number 82. <laughs> so that was my first completion. It was, what was it, like nine yards? 11 yards. We had a first down. Come on now. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I think I, I think I, I helped you avoid a hit on that play. I, I, I do want to say that I threw a yeah. little bit low. And so the safety, who was the reason that I should have worked wide side, <laughs> didn't decapitate you. <laughs> totally. Well, I need to find that film. I think I have it somewhere. I'm pretty sure I have it somewhere. I'm going to, I'm going to get that. We'll, we'll yeah. hit up EJ Borghetti and Chris Lasala on that one, man. Um, so you said uh, it was, it was too heavy for you. Yeah. I'll give you another interpretation and this will be brutal, really honest. I always felt that your ceiling was higher than everybody else's in the room, right? And you referenced the players in our room. Some went in the NFL, some are coaching the NFL, Luke Getze being that guy, right? Some played in the league, Rod being those guys, as well as the two others that you referenced in Priestley and, and Johnny Terman. So everybody in that room had a lot of success is the point at the next level of the crowd. I always th felt you had the highest ceiling. I often wondered, and maybe this is me like, expressing a, a sense of guilt, but I always felt like, man, is Pat throwing it away? And I say that because we live together at times, the coaches would ask me to always spend time to, to live with you, right? Cause, cause to your earlier point, like I wasn't gonna go screw around a lot. I was a walk on trying to find my way. Like I was pretty anal and organized in that regard. And I always felt like, man, Pat has such a gift. Is he fucking it up? And it would be partying, you know, a lot of it, majority of it was that you were never disrespectful. You never came into the facility late. You never told off a coach. You, you didn't do any of that stuff. It was the extracurricular. And, and I say that because what I asked earlier, I felt like you lived the, in air quotes, quarterback life, right? I'm going to be the star of something. Okay. It's not the team. It's not the game. It might be the service game of the week, but that ain't good enough. 
So it's going to be the party on Saturday, or it's going to be a party on Thursday. And I could remember that of like, here I was a role player. I was asleep at 930 on Thursdays because I was like, I might get my chance. And Tony O'Brien gets hurt. I get my chance and got on a scholarship, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know how that lands on you. I've never said that directly to you, but but th- that's what I felt. And I, and I, and I kind of wish I took more of a lead now. I was intimidated, I'm sure, at that age, or I felt like it wasn't my job. But I wish I had the wherewithal to say that and be like, Pat, stop, you know, and, and I, and I didn't, and, and I wish I did. And, and I don't know if you think that's truth or if that's BS. I'm, I'm comfortable either way, but I, I, I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah. So don't beat yourself up too bad there. Um, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have helped. Um, I was, I, I, that's not the first time I've heard, I heard in college that I had a lot of potential. Uh, Coach Harris had the Jersey signed I think they were all signed but at least the jersey of every starting quarterback in the NFL they were lined the, the wall of our QB room was lined with those and he held me after one day and he took his laser pointer and he said you see these and he pointed to every one of them he said none of those guys can throw it like you you have more talent god-given talent than any of these guys but he, he looked at me and he said you don't get it and he was right 100%. I didn't get it. But what I didn't get, I couldn't even begin to fathom. And knowing what I know now about what it took for me to sort of like writing up, um, going on the journey that I ended up going on to kind of get my head out of my ass, um, I wasn't going to get that at Pitt. Um, not in those circumstances. There might have been a staff somewhere in the country that could have that could have got me right. But um, I wasn't going to get it there. And I think that I wanted to be out. I wanted to be partying. I wanted to do it my way. It was important to me to be the best dart player at CJ Barney's. You know, that, that was my, that was my agenda. Thirsty Thursdays, you know, dollar, dollar, uh, long islands and quarter drafts. I mean, it was just like, I'm saying it. That's what I, that's what I remember. And you and I have spoken and those are my memories from college ball. The, the vast majority of them. There's, there's a few glimpses of like road trips and being at Notre Dame and being there at Miami and, and playing in those real big, uh, the under the lights, the national TV where everybody's watching, beating Virginia Tech and Blacksburg and getting hit with the, with the, uh, the leftovers from the turkey and, and all that stuff. Like, you know, that, that might be all your memories. My memories were more the, the partying and, sense of pride that like I could I could go out and then still make the work out and be on time and stuff like that um so I just didn't my priorities were misaligned to to an extent that that, that just wasn't that wasn't going to go good for me um under the guidance that I had there no fault to anybody's again I say it over and over again because I love coach Harris but um it just wasn't going to go good for me having having that access to the city yeah so you I'll never forget this. We go to a bowl game and you get off the bus and never come back on. How do you do that? Um, so you're speaking of when I, when I left. Yeah. You left the program. You left college. Yeah, it was, I was facing some academic stuff and I knew that was coming around the pike and I'm, you know, true to what I, the way I thought at the time, I'm going to make excuses. They're too hard on me. This isn't the right fit for me. And I'm going to, I'm going to yank myself out of the program. And so that's, that's what I did. I, I, you're right. It was like the day you guys left and I was in the practice facility first signing paperwork and then at academic support um, with, with those folks and doing some paperwork to get, to get out. And I'll never forget the academic support staff that day saying, I hope that you're not doing this because what you think is coming down the barrel in, in the springtime, like it would be bad, but you're not going to be, it's, it's not going to be as bad as you think. And I was like, no, this is about a personality conflict. And, you know, I coach doesn't like me and all the excuses in the book. It wasn't me, Yogi. It wasn't me. It was, it was everything else. And my, my situation was going to change drastically if I went somewhere else. So that was, that was how it ended. And, um, that's a that's a tough day to think about but again like I wasn't gonna know what I know now about what it took I I wasn't gonna get right there for sure so what happens next 
because again, in the eyes of the beholder and the eyes of fans, it's ah, oh, top 20, 30 quarterback. He just left us. So you're either saying, damn, Pitt screwed it up. Or you're saying, man, Pat couldn't hack it. What, what, what was, what was your mind space and headspace like? Um, my headspace was, I think, chip on my shoulder, leaving, of course, thinking that it's everybody else's fault. I had no culpability there. And I went to a Division II program. And it, that decision to leave a Division I program and go to Division II, the, the brevity of that reveals itself the second you step in the weight room. And you see the facilities and you see the, the – you essentially – you see the shine that you walked away from. And, and it hit me like a ton of bricks and my, um, my behavior patterns, they, they got worse. And I ended up dipping out of that situation. You know, I think like 10 weeks into it. Um, I, that, that was a shock. And that was, that was when it started to get real. Like, what have I done? That was the first time I think like seeing the practice facility, seeing the weight room, it was noticeable. I was like, what did I do? Like, this is different. What did I walk, what did I walk away from here? And um, that's a lot to handle when you were my age and just in that headspace. And so that's what happened next. I went to a, a small division two school up in Northwestern PA called Edinburgh. And I ended up leaving there after, I think about eight weeks, 10 weeks, um, just because it, it just flooded, the emotion flooded me and uh, I quit, I quit altogether. Three schools uh, within a, a short period of time. Yeah, it was. Um, a loss doesn't quite quantify it. I, I don't know what the, I don't know what the right word is there. But uh, it was definitely, you felt far away from everything, completely unrelatable. Uh, a lot of emotion, you know, a lot of misplaced anger, and. Uh, like no tools in the toolbox to look inward at that point in life, you know, um, you had some of those, I think, and that's what helped you. I'll say it again. Like I could just see you map out your days and know what you're going to get better at from the, the time you spent in the weight room, the extra reps you got, any quarterback that needed a receiver, you were there, you were, you know, intern at the mayor's office. You, you were doing everything. You were everywhere. And I was just, trying to be like trying to figure out where I wanted to be next so like you know, uh, it was all I could do to plan the bus ride down to the practice facility so um yeah it was it, it felt I felt off felt off track for sure so then you hop on another track which is otherwise known as Greyhound yeah I uh my my parents and I, you know, we went back and forth about, I think, what are you going to do? What's, what's going to be your next move? Um, we had disagreements and I had had a, a friend from high school who was in uh, Florida in the air force. And I saw him over a holiday and a couple of weeks later, um, yeah, some things happened at the house and I'm like, I'm, I'm getting out of here. And I mean, when I say I'm getting out of here, like not, I'm moving out, I'm getting out of Erie. And I called my buddy who was in Florida and said, he's still looking for a roommate. You know, what's your situation? And he was like, yeah, come on. And the next morning I got on a Greyhound bus with the big pit duffel bag and I think like 60 bucks. And I got on and, and that was, that was it. It was a, that was a long ride. Have you ever done something where you like, it was a big decision and you don't know even to this day if it was the right one but you were so nervous about it you could like still smell it still feel what the remember what the greyhound bus seats felt like yeah. like what it smelled like you know and there was like 13 stops on the way and uh, you know you end up in fort walton beach florida and <laughs> left in a snowstorm and you get off the pair the bus in a pair of sweatpants <laughs> and it's like 70 degrees on January 16th, you know, and, uh, that was how it, that was how it happened. It was that, it was that quick. And from then on, it was just, I think it's at first, it was like not going home, not going home, not going home. And, um, I didn't want to be known as a football player. I didn't, I didn't talk about that story too much with, 
anything that I did. It was about getting a job. I didn't have a car. So I, I applied to places that I could walk to from the place that I was staying at and um, ended up working uh, a couple of interesting jobs, mornings at a tropical smoothie and busting tables in an Italian restaurant at, at night. And that was how, how my journey in Florida kind of started. How old were you? I was 24 years old. You're 24 when you got on the Greyhound? Yeah. So what did you do between leaving Edinburgh? Like what was, like how old were you then? Like you couldn't have been more than 20. Um, no, I was, I, I mean, I was only home for a year after getting out of the situation at Pitt. So it was, I thought about trying to play again. I actually, I don't know if you remember Coach Mons. He was at a school and I went down and I had never dealt with injury and I slipped a disc in my back and it just put me out. Yeah. And um, it was to the point where like, you know, that, that type of school that he was at was real slim on scholarships and it wasn't going to work for me if I wasn't on the ride. So I had to go home even from that. And that was no fault of my own. That was like the fall. So if we're roadmap, if we're like, laying it out December of 2002 I leave Pitt February of 2003 I leave Edinburgh and then August of 2003 I got to coach Mons and I was there and played in camp and stuff like that get hurt but had to leave there in September so I think that there was some hope for my parents when I made a decision to go try to play for coach Mons but then when I got home, things just went south. I was so bored. I wasn't interested in anything. I wasn't engaged in anything. I was just kind of hanging out with the buddies from high school and hopping around Erie partying and didn't really have a job. And um, I think that that really wore on my folks and ended up becoming a wedge. And so in January of 2004, um, on the 14th, that's when I got on the, got on the Greyhound bus. Um, but to sum it up in between pit and getting on the Greyhound, I mean, a lot of, a lot of partying, a lot of, a lot of smoke and weed, a lot of, you know, that type, that type of stuff and nothing that was lending it to me in any way, shape or form. And, um, that Greyhound ended up being the first semi-step to, to getting things on track. So how did you feel about the game? Right. Again, you're a huge recruit. You go to a local school, you're billed as the savior clearly doesn't work out. It doesn't work out again at other schools. Yeah. And then you have the same duffel bag, which I think is just ironic that yeah. you're traveling out of Florida with, and you don't, to use your words, you don't want to identify with football. So what'd you think of the game? You know, I didn't hate the game. I still love to watch it. I still, uh, I still, I think had an immense amount of respect for my old teammates at, at Pitt and the people who were on that journey. But I just kind of felt like it, it ruined me a little bit and I just wanted a fresh start. Um, I wanted to see what I could do if I wasn't a football player, if that wasn't the first thing that popped in other people's heads, popped in my head. Am I good at anything else? You know, um, to go back to the beginning of the conversation, it always just felt like the next thing, the next season, the next game, the next week. So you feel like you just follow that that wave um not necessarily even ride or be skillful to stay on it because god-given talent keeps you there but so when i got to florida i was kind of like i think i just want to be a guy i can yeah. work really hard i'm in good shape i'm going to be able to work long hours like let me just let me just settle in and do something else for a while and there's worse places to be than fort walton beach oh. Florida. <laughs> i'm really lucky that i ended up down there uh, it's a beautiful place Weather's great, lots of spring jobs, big tourist attraction. So finding a job wasn't hard at all. And I got really lucky. I fell in with some pretty decent people in terms of they, they own like different things, restaurants and whatnot. And they'd always help me like if I needed to make a couple extra bucks, here's a side job, go do it. Um, so I got comfortable in that light. I was like, I've always been a great quarterback, but this isn't bad either. Like work, I can work really hard. I can do a lot of stuff. I can learn quick. So um, that, that was, that was what I started to get good at and sort of just find myself, you know, um, figure out what winning felt like on my own, no God given talent to, 
to be able to be a good bus boy or a good tropical smoothie dude like you can either make the rap and <laughs> or you can't you know and uh th so learning became my thing learning 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 and planning and uh that got fun quick for me yeah that's that that's that's really interesting when, when did you because you grew up in you know for those that don't know Pennsylvania, Texas, California, like big football states. Go back yeah. to the 90s, huge football state Pennsylvania was. You were obviously a big deal there. I feel like you lived kind of like the Varsity Blues high school life. I don't know if it's true, but I'm curious. Like, when, when was your first drink? Uh, first, first drink was ninth grade. Um, summer after ninth grade. Uh, just out in a buddy's backyard somebody's got a case of beer hey here's a beer and um you know there was some stuff insecurity and whatnot i was like yeah well, i'll do it i'll be like everybody else and uh that was that was that that was my first that was my first drink and what do you think was the longest you'd gone without a drink from then until you got on that bus to go to florida mm. Maybe a couple, couple weeks. Maybe. What was it? And what was it like when you got to college? Oh well, you get the keys to the city when you get somewhere like that. You know, you can you can get into most anywhere. So it was just, it was just party hard. It was party city. And you're, you were uh, exposed to enough of it that you, you saw like that was, an option every single night. And I yeah. took it. Yeah. And I don't think that's much different than a lot of people in college, you know, right. like, or, or athletes, like you get exposed to alcohol at parties in high school, especially if you live in a cool place or in the middle of nowhere, in my case, uh, you're a good football player, your case, then you go to college and it's a good time after the games, like it's pretty much the case. You can have a drink probably every week of the year or every week here on campus, maybe more than that. Right. Did you, did you ever think it was an issue? Yeah. Yeah, I knew in college. I knew in college it was an issue. I talked I talked to some people about, you know, just flat out saying like I've got I got a, I got a problem. I want to do some things, take some steps and whatnot. And but like who? Is that like a coach? Is that like a therapist? Yeah, it was, like a, a, it was a it was a coach on this on the staff and um I got a lot to think about. It was kind of like, you know, that becomes your identity in a way, because you say I have this issue. And then, you know, that's inherently what some folks are going to think about first. So it's the message was sort of be real careful with that. Like if you can deal with that without making a declaration, then try to do that. But that's kind of not the way that thing works is what I learned is like, you've got to tell yourself a bit. like, there's a problem. You got to tell some people around you, like, there's a problem. I'm making a commitment. And so that way some folks see you and they, they, they check in on you and they make sure that um, you're not steering back to anything, you know? Uh, so I did, I, I, I talked to some people in college and um, that was the messaging I got back was let's, let's be real careful with that. Yeah. That, what, what interesting statement compared to where we are today, right? Where, it's welcomed in a different in a different way. I'm not saying it wasn't welcome then to state what you're going through, but it's 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 just a different time. I, I wish you told me why why didn't you? Uh, it's a perceived weakness thing, you know. You knew that it would have been like, duh. <laughs> Look at you, uh, you're swimming in a bottle every every night or every other night. But still, like to say it is a big deal. And it's a big deal. You ask people who have gone down the path of like getting sober and it's, it's a really big deal to declare that you can wake up after a really bad five day rager and, and be like, I'm not doing this again. I can't do this anymore. You know, but you're saying it in your own head and you'll find a lot of reasons to give yourself an excuse to do it the next time then, you know, oh, I feel better. Oh, I drained out. I, I dried out, uh, you know, nothing, nothing bad happened that type of thing. But when you put that information and in the people around you here, and then they're aware of it and they can help you to sort of walk a line. And uh, it's different. 
And so I, I think I didn't tell you because I was just, I was scared. I would probably thought, oh, I can do this on my own. I can, I can quell this on my own. And um, that would have been, well, I, you know, I can't, I can't remember ever having really thought about it. I thought about it enough to talk to a coach, Yogi, but not, not any of my, uh, not any of my teammates. And honestly, I kind of wish I would have. Um, it might have, uh, it might have changed some things for me had I had some accountability because our locker room was filled with great people. We know that today. Look at so, what some of the folks in our program are doing. Penny Smythe, Sean Robinson. Just look, just look at that, the roster and names that we had around us. Chris Wilson, like, um, just some great human beings. And uh, I wish that I would have felt comfortable in that conversation with somebody because what my gut tells me now is that they would have probably pulled some more people in the room and be like, we got your back, we can help you through this. You know, it's not nothing, it's not easy, but we can, we can be, we can, we can help you navigate this, but I didn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When did you, when did you stop drinking? Uh, July 12th, 2018. I say that because uh, it's either that day or the day after you did call and you told me you were done drinking and that you had a problem. Mm -hmm. what, what, what got you to the place to, to stop? Because if your first drink is in 1996, 1995 to July 12th, 2018, I believe is what you said. Yeah. So that's a nice, that's a nice little span there. Right. Um, I don't know, you know, there's a story that goes along with that for me, but just getting to a, to a dark enough place that I was, I was really down. I had some serious questions about the life that I was living and if it was serving me at all, and if I could even get into a life that would serve me um, based on just what my my pattern of habits was at that time and how deep into the hole of like pretty hardcore alcoholism I was. And the worst part about it for me is that I was sort of making it at the same, like I, I, was, I wasn't the guy that was gonna lose his job because he was drinking, you know? But like just emotionally, mentally, mental health, like alcohol was really rough on my mental health. And um, I think hitting a, hitting the wall, it was like you, like there, there has got to be a change, uh, you know, go down the path where you end up, you know, where you end up dead from a car accident or something to that effect, or you, you quit drinking and you get out of this. And I did have my like really bad night. Um, I'll never forget it. And the next day just had enough of a moment of clarity to call my primary care physician. He's like, I need to come in right now. I got a serious problem. I really, I'm in the mood to deal with it. I, I, I want to talk to you about options and um, ended up at, at uh, Emory. University Hospital downtown to talk to my primary care physician for like two hours that day and talk about you know what I was feeling and she was probably doing due diligence to make sure like I was all right and I was in a good enough headspace to let me walk out that day and uh, she did and um, you know my path was a little bit different I took uh, the option of getting on a prescription that kind of makes you really ill if you if you drink while you're on it and that was my um, that was my path. And uh, stayed on that script for a while, but, you know, got some other good habits. Once I got started getting sober and getting interested in some other things, uh, yoga became a big part of my life. And I think like after about six or seven months, quit the, quit the pill and left alcohol in my rear view. And I'm, you know, coming up on three years. Yeah. Th thanks for sharing that. And your dad, you're married. Mm-hmm. Like you have this glow about you, Pat. I've seen you at all phases of your life. I'm, I'm so thankful we have stayed connected. So I want to ask you, like, you, you, didn't, you may not have had an answer at 15 or 16 or 17 of the vision, but one was put on you, which was start at this school, be a big time quarterback in this system, go make a lot of money in the NFL, and then do whatever the hell you want. 
right? That was kind of what it meant to make it from an outsider's perspective of you. Even as a teammate, that was an expectation of me, of you. And, and none, of those that ha- none of those happened. So, so how do you define making it now? Um, for me, it's not a definitive point in time. It's, you know, I've got, um, I call them my butts, my, uh, you know, things are going well, but there's this, but there's that, you know, and we all have those. It, you, you go through life and you, there's something in the corner that you want to deal with. And you, you know, you figure out a way to when the time is right. And those are, those are your butts, you know, that relationship that you need to work on that, um, your weight your health in general, you know, I made my job's going great, but I'm not in the best shape that I could be. My, uh, uh, my relationship with my family is really strong, but, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm not doing great for like my day to day. I don't, I don't have good hobbies. So I have a good relationship with my butts. And to me, that's, that's making it, that's like, that was making it for me. It's different for everybody. I think it's for, for some people, it is moments of time. They dream about something their whole life and they get to that place and they've made it. Um, but for me, and I think for my experience and just sort of figuring out over the past few years, like what I'm really capable of. And as a sober human being, like my, my making it right now, at the age I'll be 40 and a couple months after you, this summer, um, my making it is, is good relationships with my butts and the things that I, you know, that are my challenges and knowing that I'm making little micro progress on all those at any given time. And none of them are going to drag me too far down. Um, they're all moving forward. That's, that's making it for me. Um, and that's probably a little different than the answers that you've gotten over the course of the show, but that's what makes us human. That's that we're all, we all think a little bit differently. And uh, so that's my, that's my answer in a roundabout way. I love that. What, what would you say to, it doesn't have to be the young you, but a version of you that exists now. They're everywhere. Everybody mm-hmm. signs them. Some of them enter the portal and transfer. Right. Some of them make it to the league. Some of them never play a snap. But what would you say to the quarterback right now who's at a place where there's a lot happening for him and can flick it with the flick of a wrist? Yeah. Start to develop relationships all around you. Take time to develop relationships because there's not much that translates from the time you're 16. You can't be good at much at the age of 16 that's going to lend to you at 25, 30, 35. It's a very short list. In my experience, it might be different for yours. But relationships, if you get really good at that early on, you can be really good at relationships at 25, 35, 45. So I would say get good at relationships because that truly, I believe, that's where we, we become through relationships. Those relationships are mirrors of who we are at any place, any time in our lives. And they don't have to be with people who are, you know, well-respected, well-known, well-accomplished. They can be your buddies in high school. Focus on your friendships. Focus on your relationship with your parents and your coaches. Have one. Have a relationship with people. And focus on growing those. You'll learn a lot about yourself. You'll learn what you like. You'll learn what works for you. You'll learn how you communicate. You'll learn how you learn. Um, That'll be something that you can stay engaged with. Because then at any point in time, it's like I lost last week. It was a big game. But, man, I'm going to go hang out with, like, I'm going to go stop by eight folks' place today when I'm home on my, you know, my weekend off. And you get to just water yourself and water all those relationships that you that you've developed and worked on instead of sitting and wondering, oh, if I would have done that throw or if I would have made that decision instead of this one. Like it truly gives you an escape. It gives you an out. And and you will learn a lot about yourself and you will grow exponentially through relationships. If you make it a focus, then you can do that. You can do that at you can do that as an eight-year-old. You can do that as a 12 year old, you know, you can, and, and I'm doing it as a 40 year old. You're doing it as a 40 year old, Makai, developing a relationship with him. I'm sure it's teaching you a lot. I'm developing a relationship with Sawyer. It's teaching me a lot. Still developing a relationship with my wife. It's teaching me a lot. So I'd say that, Hey, Hey, younger Pat. Hey, every 16 year old out there, whether you're the starter or the fourth stringer, 
focus on relationships. They will, they will carry you. They will be your bridges over water. You may not always see them, but they'll be there. You can walk on them. And that, that, that ends up being your network. That ends up being your connectivity to the world. And it's, uh, it, it's a big deal. Do that. Focus on that. I'm glad that we've maintained a relationship, man. It's a oh, joy. It's a fantastic one over the course of these last, uh, it's 2021. We were, you, you know, we're about 21 years now. So yeah. it's been a joy. You've been an inspiration to me, Yogi, in a lot of ways. You've been a sounding board. Uh, you've held me accountable. We've had some tough conversations, um, but you've always been a, a good ear. And this is definitely a friendship that uh, I'm looking forward to for for the rest of the time because it's been, it's it's lent to me greatly so far. Yeah, and we always have 84 pop. We always have 84 pop. I love it. Um, huh? Can I say one more thing before we ditch? Yeah, please do. Yeah, just to respect mental health awareness month you know we're we're in june now and that was that was may but i just want to say something as a thought that's been in my mind for a long time now we're all good people i believe that the, or the vast majority of us are good people first we want to we want to help people and i i don't believe that most of us would yank a crutch out from somebody that's walking across the street you know we'd keep going um that's a visible crutch. Mental health is an invisible crutch. And sometimes what you say, how you handle a conversation, how you react to somebody that's having a bad day, you end up yanking a crutch out and you don't know it. And so having an awareness of mental health, that it's a thing, it's a big part of our life, whether we know it or not, it drives a lot of our behavior and how we feel and how the people around us even feel. Um, I would just ask that anybody that listens to this, be aware of that. Everybody's got a crutch. You may not see it, but you can you can yank it out really easily. Uh, and sometimes it's just as simple as opening the door for somebody or not reacting when somebody gets short with you. You know, that that type of stuff can go a long way and we need more of that. So I'll hop off my, my soapbox now, but I just wanted to put that out there because mental health is a big part of my story, my ethos. And um, that's something really important I've had to learn. So I just wanted to try to tie off with that. I totally agree. Huge uh, supporter of that, especially in the last year that everybody's had of just checking in, right? Like our th a therapist that I talked to, she says, um, which I fully advocate, she says, hey, have a little self-compassion every once in a while. Yeah. And I know for, for high achievers, you know, or people who aspire at high achievement, I'm always a walk on, like you never say good job, right? Like mm -hmm. I, even when I got to put on scholarship, it was like, of course I did. Like that was the plan. You, know, you said I mapped out plans. I've mapped out plans. I've never celebrated the execution of a plan though. Up until this last year, celebrated a show for the first time that I sold and was a part of. So I think at every layer of everybody's journey, there's a point to defining and redefining, like make it, right? It could be make it through the next minute, the next hour, the full day it could be showing up for your kids, I mean, whatever it is. I, that, that, that's really the part of this series. I put a bow on it, like has led me to this question, you know, and it's, and it's unearthed a lot of really cool dialogue pad of what does it mean to make it like, is it 10 cars and three homes? Is it a box and a happy family? Like, is it healthy food and good experiences? Like, is it, adulation and admiration and pats on the back. Like, I, I think it's a really worthwhile discussion because if you're not careful, making it can all of a sudden become the thing, right? And all of a sudden become the, um, I call it the wonder switch. All of a sudden, like your lights could be turned off because somebody didn't say that you made it versus right. your sense of wonderment and imagination is always turned on by you or by us or by our own flick of the, flick of the wrist per se. So yeah, man, this, this is a great bow to put on this uh, this series around around a simple question. So thanks for doing it, man. I really appreciate you having me on, Yogi. This has been fun. Um, we catch up off, often, but not like this. And uh, congratulations on the show, by the way. And uh, I I really appreciate being here, man. This is this has been great. Yeah, Pat Hoderny. There were sixteen, right? That we rocked. 14? Sixteen and fourteen. Yeah, sixteen and fourteen. Yeah. I knew it. Always the uh, 
the competitor at Planks from the summer of 2000. I'll, I'll never forget that at the University of Pittsburgh. It's really the greatest post route that I ever caught. And uh, <laughs> somebody who's a close friend, Pat, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it, man. You're welcome, Yogi. Cool. If you want more of these conversations, it's real easy. Just go to yogiroth.com. There's a whole section around this series, which I did over the course of 2021 around what does it mean to make it. So define it for yourself, ask people the question and create the dialogue. Uh, summertime now. So after this pod, I'm taking a breather. I'm going on vacation. I'm going to be full-time dad. And then we're coming back with a season. Already have some really cool podcasts recorded from some big time head coaches. All of my broadcast schedule out as well. I got some great games I'm going to be doing first couple weeks of the season with some big programs on the West Coast. So as always, if you love sports and humanity, subscribe. If you want college football news, check out the newsletter, How Great Is Ball? It drops every Saturday. And I hope you have a happy and healthy summer. I'm out. Peace.